Well, hello and welcome to our third Thursday webinar. I am Tom Sandry and today we are going to be talking about optical fiber testing, an introduction to optical fiber cable and testing strategies. So, let's get started. Fiber optic cables are often seen as the gold standard for network cabling. They offer unparalleled performance uh, to their typical copper counterparts, and they can therefore cover much greater distances without bumping up against signal degradation. There are a wide range of fiber optic cable types, styles, and with different connectors on each end. Depending upon what sort of distance you want to cover with your networking wiring and what kind of performance you expect, you might want to opt for one fiber optic cable type over another. This is going to be an introduction to what you need to know about the various fiber optic cable types, what makes them so useful, and what type of fiber optic cable you want to buy for your next networking project. Fiber optic cables are, like their name suggests, a cable that uses light rather than electricity to transmit information. They're made from silica glass fibers about the same width as a human hair, which allows the light to bounce back and forth down the length of the cabling. To prevent the light leaking out and ensure it is reflected down the length of the cable, the glass core of the fiber optic cable is surrounded by a thin layer of glass cladding. That is further insulated by a primary coating of plastic which offers physical protection for the internal glass structure of the cable and prevents excessive bending. Most high quality fiber optic cables then further protect the core of the wiring with an extra layer of strengthening fibers which are made of different materials depending on the manufacturer. Some use Kelvar, others gel filled sleeves, but most serve the same purpose and have the same result of reinforcing the cable protection and rigidity. The final outer layer is a jacket of colored plastic to help identify the fiber optic cable type and provide even greater protection to the interior. Most outer layers also provide a layer of fire resistance for the wiring with different ratings given to each so buyers can know the level of protection their cabling provides. So let's now talk about single mode versus multi-mode fiber. Single mode means the fiber enables one type of light mode to be propagated at a time, while multi-mode means the fiber can propagate multiple modes. The difference between single mode and multi-mode fiber optic cable mainly lie in the fiber core diameter, wavelength, and light source, bandwidth, color sheath, distance and cost. So core diameters. Single mode fiber core diameter is much smaller than multimode fiber. Its typical core diameter is 9 micrometers, even if there are others available. And multimode fiber core diameter is 50 micrometer and 62 and a half micrometer typically which enables it to have higher light gathering ability and simplify connections. The cladding diameter of single mode and multimode fiber is 125 micrometers. The attenuation of multimode fiber is higher than single mode fiber because of its large core diameter. The fiber core of single mode cable is very narrow, so the light that passes through these fiber uh, optic cables is not reflected too many times, which keeps the attenuation to a minimum. All right, now let's look at wavelength and light source. Due to the large core size of multimode fiber, some low cost light sources like light emitting diodes or LEDs and uh, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers that work at 850 nanometer and 1300 nanometer wavelengths are used in multimode fiber cables. 
while the single mode fiber often uses a laser or laser diodes to produce light injected into the cable. And the commonly used single mode fiber wavelength is 1310 nanometer, 1550 nanometer, and 1625 nanometer. Bandwidth. Multimode fiber bandwidth is limited by its light mode and the maximum bandwidth at present is about 28,000 megahertz to kilometer of OM5 fiber, while single mode fiber bandwidth is unlimited theoretically because it allows only one light mode to pass through at a time. Now, next let's look at the color of the sheath. We have been using different types of fiber optic cables in labs and data centers for years. It is not unusual for a green hand to mix up the 50-125 and 62.5-125 multimode fibers or the single mode fibers, not to mention the multimode fiber cables that may consist of tens of hundreds of fibers. Fortunately, there are systems made to address these issues, such as the EIA-TIA-598, which is the most recognized system worldwide. It includes fiber color code for different types and numbers of optical fiber cables. These fiber optic cable color codes help us to identify an optical fiber cable from its jacket, buffer, tube, connector, etc. Color outer jackets or print may be used on outside plant and premise fiber cables. Example, fiber distribution cables, fiber optic patch cords, etc. In EIA TIA 598, the fiber color code defines the jacket color code for different fiber types. So for optical fiber cable that contains only one type of fiber, we can easily identify it by its jacket color, unless otherwise specified. The outer jacket of premise cable containing more than one fiber type shall use a printed legend to identify the quantities and types of fiber within the cable. For example, it might state 12 fiber, 8 by 50 by 125, four times 62 and a half by 125. Now, here are the jacket color codes for different fiber types. Besides the jacket color specified in the fiber color code standard, other colors may be used if the print on the outer jacket can tell the fiber classification. Such colors, though, should be agreed upon between the manufacturer and the user. Now let's take a look at connector types. There are a few different reasons why there are so many kinds of fiber connector types. The first is that there are simply different cables for different jobs. There are connectors designed for single mode and multimode optical cables. There are connectors designed to offer greater in-socket stability so they cannot easily fall out or be pulled free when in place. There are connectors uh, which have dual or duplex connections and others with single or simplex connections. There are connectors which are designed to be more durable or offer greater protection uh, for the cable itself, such as having a longer boot, and there are others which don't with shorter boots. There are smaller and larger connectors too. The fiber optic cable standards have changed over the years also, leading to newer, more advanced connectors. Different manufacturers have also made attempts at creating new standards, and when they have received some adoption, but not full compliance across industries, that results in an even greater number of available connectors, some of which do much the same job as each other but in slightly different ways. 
So looking at some of the connectors, let's start with the Lucent connectors or LC. Lucent connectors, typically known as LC connectors, were developed by Lucent Technologies as a small form factor solution to fiber optic connections. They have some of the smallest ferrules at just 1.25 millimeter thick, making them a small form factor fiber connector type. Their size, square shape, and duplex header design make them ideal for heavily populated patch panels and cabinets where packing in as many connectors as possible into a tight space is the goal. It's one of the most used fiber optic connectors today and works with both multi-mode and single mode cables. Cables fitted with LC connectors are fairly difficult to remove once plugged in making them one of the sturdiest cable connector standards. However, that can prove problematic as their small form factor encourages dense packing in patch panels and data cabinets, which can make deliberately removing individual LC connector uh, cables quite difficult. To help with that, some network administrators will use an LC connector extraction tool, which makes the process a bit easier. Next, let's look at the standard connectors. SC connectors were developed by the Japanese telecom company NTT, and though the original name may have been subscriber connector, they're typically known as standard connectors or SC connectors. They're a square-shaped duplex connector that uses a 2.5 millimeter ferrule and has a push-pull mechanism to latch them in place. This makes them more robust than other connectors like ST connectors, so the signal won't be interrupted if the cable is pulled. This is an older connection that is slowly being replaced, but has been a standard for long enough that it has seen extensive use in networks all over the world. While its square shape does make it useful for fitting into smaller places, more modern, uh, leaner connections like LC connectors have proved uh, more effective and space saving, so are seeing greater use in newer networks. The ST connectors. ST connectors were developed by AT&T and were one of the first uh, fiber connector types to see widespread adoption in fiber optic networks all over the world. The straight tip ST design has a 2.5 millimeter ferrule, the same as SC connectors, and can be used interchangeably with that alternative connector type when using a hybrid adapter. It features a spring-loaded half-turn bayonet style lock that makes it quick and easy to attach and detach, all whilst providing additional security against accidental disconnects. It's not foolproof with other fiber connector types offering a more robust connection, but it's still useful. It isn't the best solution in tighter patch panels and cabinets either, when it can be hard to get uh, the purchase necessary to perform the unlocking turn. Typically, they are used with multi-mode fiber optic cables. SD connectors see a lot of usage in uh, legacy networks, although they are slowly being replaced by newer cables. The furl core connectors. FC connectors are so named because they were the first to be built with a ceramic ferrule with a stainless steel screw mechanism for attachment. This is a stark contrast to the plastic body of most other fiber connectors types such as the SC and LC connectors. FC connectors are designed to provide a much more robust connection that is almost immune to accidental removal, thereby guaranteeing there won't be any interruption in the data. The keyed screw connection with FC connectors means that installing and uninstalling them takes extra effort, and they aren't as well suited to tight spaces where you can't get enough purchase to complete the screw mechanism. 
However, the inconvenience can be worth it when the uh, sanctity of the connection is the most important factor. Mostly used with single mode fiber optic cables, FC connectors are commonly used in networks designed to transmit consistent information such as video streams where any drop in the data connection could cause an immediate and observed interruption of the data. They are however seeing reduced use in newer networks with administrators preferring the ease of use with the LC and SC connectors. The multi-position connectors, MPO connectors, sometimes marked interchangeably with MTP connectors, are simplex fiber connector types with a push-pull latch system that locks them into place. While MTP is largely a branding choice rather than a distinct connector type, the connectors were designed with higher performance networks in mind, while MPO connectors are more commonly marked toward less demanding applications. Both fiber connector types work with single mode and multi-mode cables. The furl is slightly angled on single mode cables, though they see this most usage in high bandwidth multi-mode cables due to the way the connector combines up to 24 glass fibers within a single rectangular ferrule. MPO MTP connectors are particularly complicated to use due to potential issues with polarity arising from misconfigured cabling. Network administrators need to make sure they use the right configuration of cable to avoid any problems with signal transmission. The MTRJ connectors, mechanical transfer registered jack connectors are duplex connectors developed by Amp, Tyco, and Corning. They use pins for alignment and come in both male and female guises. It has a plastic body with a tubular locking mechanism to hold it in place once connected. They are one of the least common fiber connector types used today, though still see some use in legacy systems and networks. With a small ferrule, MTRJ connectors have seen use in the past in more compact patch panels and cabinets and have mostly been used with multi-mode fibers. Today, however, there are plenty of alternatives uh, which network administrators usually gravitate toward instead. All right, now let's start to delve into fiber optic principles. Optical materials are categorized by their index of refraction, referred to as N. A material's index of refraction is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the material. When a beam of light passes from one material to another with a different index of refraction, the beam is bent or refracted at the interface. Now, Refraction is described by Snell's law, seen here, where n sub 1 and n sub r are the indices of refraction of the materials through which the beam is refracted, and i and r are the angles of incidence and refraction of the beam. Total internal reflection. If the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle for the interface, typically about 82 degrees for optical fibers, the light is reflected back into the incident medium without loss by a process known as internal reflection. The internal reflection allows light to remain inside the core of the fiber. All right, now let's talk about modes. When light is guided down a fiber, as microwaves are guided down a wavelength, phase shifts occur at every reflective boundary. 
there is a definite discrete number of paths down the optical fiber known as modes that produce constructive in phase and therefore additive phase shifts that reinforce the transmission. Because each mode occurs at a different angle to the fiber axis as the beam travels along the length, each one travels a different length through the fiber from the input to the output. Only one mode, the zero order mode, travels the length of the fiber without reflections from the sidewalls. This is known as a single mode fiber. The actual number of modes that can be propagated in each optical fiber is determined by the wavelength of light and the diameter and index of refraction of the core of the fiber. All right, now let's take a look at attenuation. Signals lose strength as they are propagated through the fiber. This is known as beam attenuation. Attenuation is measured in decibels, or dB, with the relation, the attenuation in dB equals 10 log times the power in divided by the power out, where P sub in and P sub out refer to the optical power going into and coming out of the fiber. The table shows the power typically lost in a fiber for several values of attenuation in decibels. The attenuation of an optical fiber is wavelength dependent. At the extremes of the transmission curve, multiphoton absorption predominates. Attenuation is usually expressed in dB per kilometer at a specific wavelength. Typical values range from 10 dB per kilometer uh, for stepped index fibers at 850 nanometer to a few tenths of a dB per kilometer for single mode fibers at 1550 nanometers. There are several causes of attenuation in an optical fiber. Let's start with Rayleigh scattering. The light source is partially scattered in all directions as it propagates down the length of the fiber. The scattering of light in the opposite direction to the original light source is called backscattering. So, Rayleigh scattering. Microscopic scale variations in the index of refraction of the core material can cause considerable scatter in the beam, leading to substantial losses of optical power. Rayleigh scattering is wavelength dependent and is less significant at longer wavelengths. This is the most important loss mechanism in modern optical fibers, generally accounting for up to 90% of the loss that is experienced. Next, let's look at absorption, when the light is converted to another form of energy. You know this occurs when the light simply disappears as it enters another medium. Now, current manufacturing methods have reduced absorption caused by impurities, most notably water in the fiber, to very low levels. Within the bandwidth of transmission of the fiber, absorption losses are insignificant. Next, let's take a look at bending. Sometimes bends will be great enough to cause the light within the core to hit the core cladding interface at less than the critical angle, so the light is lost into the cladding material. Manufacturing methods can produce minute bends in the fiber geometry. Sometimes these bends will be great enough to cause the light within the core to hit the core cladding interface at less than the critical angle so that light is lost into the cladding material. This also can occur when the fiber is bent in a tight radius, let's say a few centimeters. Bend sensitivity is usually expressed in terms of dB per kilometer loss for a particular bend radius and wavelength. All right, now let's move on to testing. As fiber deployments become commonplace, network owners and technicians are paying more attention to the two crucial devices for testing fiber optic cable the Optical Loss Test Set, or OLTS, 
and the Optical Time Domain Reflectometer, also known as the OTDR. An optical loss test set provides the most accurate insertion loss measurement on a link by using a light source on one end and a power meter on the other to measure exactly how much light is coming out at the opposite end. It is required for fiber testing per industry standards. Both TIA and ISO standards use the term Tier 1 to describe testing with an optical loss test set. An OTDR categorizes the loss of the link for individual splices and connectors by transmitting light pulses into a fiber and measuring the amount of light reflected from each pulse. It is recommended for fiber testing per industry standards, essential for emerging short-reach single-mode applications and extremely valuable as part of a complete testing strategy. Testing with both an OTDR and an optical loss test set is referred to as Tier 2 testing within the TIA standards and extended testing within the ISO standards. While the measurements taken by these two instruments seem similar, they perform distinct yet important roles. An optical loss test set is a mainstay for testing fiber optic cabling because it provides the most accurate method for determining the total loss of a link and it is required by industry standards to ensure the link can meet the loss requirements for a given application. The test is performed with a light source which produces a continuous wave at specific wavelengths connected to one end of the fiber. A power meter with a photo detector is connected to the opposite end of the fiber link. The detector measures optical power at the same wavelength produced by the light source. Working in concert, these devices determine the total amount of light lost. Now, industry standards specify insertion loss limits for specific fiber applications, which is a combination of a loss budget and length. As required by both TIA 568-3.D and ISO IEC 14763-3 standards for Tier 1 fiber optic testing, the loss measured with an optical loss test set is compared to the insertion loss limits for a given application to determine if it passes. Note that a light source power meter also accurately measures loss per industry standards but does not include some of the key optical loss test set features that facilitate testing such as duplex testing, hands-free bi-directional testing, preloading of loss limits, length measurement, and other advanced features. Length is especially important because application limits are a combination of a loss budget and a maximum length. All right, now let's move on to the optical time domain reflectometer or OTDR. Unlike the optical loss test set that measures the amount of light coming out of the far end, the OTDR measures the amount of light reflected back to the source. By computing the difference between the amount of reflection at the near end and far ends, the OTDR can infer the amount of loss in the fiber. OTDRs use special pulse laser diodes to transmit high-powered light pulses into a fiber. As the pulses travel down the fiber, most of the light travels in that direction. High gain light detectors measure any light that is reflected from each pulse. The OTDR uses these measurements to detect events in the fiber that reduce or reflect the power in the source pulse. 
A small fraction of the pulse light is also scattered in a different direction due to the normal structure of fiber and small defects in the glass. This phenomena of light scattered by impurities in the fiber is called backscattering, as we learned earlier. So, what does an OTDR actually measure? Well, it measures attenuation, also called fiber loss. It is expressed in dB or dB per kilometer. Now, this represents uh, the loss or rate of loss between two events along a fiber span. Also, the OTDR will show and measure event losses, which are expressed in dB. Also, event reflections, which is also expressed in dB. The OTDR will provide distance to events between events and to the fiber end expressed in kilometers, feet, or miles. Also, optical return loss, or ORL. This is expressed in dB. Now, this is great for troubleshooting. Dirty, bad connectors cause bad optical return loss, and the OTDR identifies the location of the bad connectors. Now, beyond optical loss testing, optical loss testing only tells you part of the story. If there is a problem, you need an OTDR to locate it. The OTDR trace can reveal issues that an optical loss test set misses, such as bends, bad splices, bad or poorly made connectors, or mismatched fiber sections. So let's look at the working principles of an OTDR. An OTDR contains a laser diode source, a photodiode detector, and a highly accurate timing circuit, or time base. The laser emits a pulse of light at a specific wavelength. The pulse of light travels along the fiber being tested. As the pulse moves down the fiber, portions of the transmitted light are reflected or refracted or scattered back down the fiber to the photodetector in the OTDR. The intensity of the returning light and the time taken for it to arrive back at the detector tells us the loss value, insertion and reflection, the type and location of the event in the fiber link. Now, light is returned to the photodetector through several mechanisms. The Rayleigh scattering and backscattering, Fresnel reflection, as well as absorption. Physicists of previous centuries were still consumed with such fundamental questions as, why is the sky blue? The answer to this question, as discovered by Lord Rayleigh in 1904, is what is known as Rayleigh scattering. When light photons scatter off molecules in the air, the resulting light waves visible on the Earth are predominantly at the blue end of the spectrum, because blue light is scattered more efficiently than red. Now, when light is injected into a fiber, some of the photons of light are scattered in random directions due to microscopic particles in the fiber. This effect is Rayleigh scattering. In addition, some of the light is scattered back in the opposite direction of the transmitted light. This is referred to as backscattering. The predictable nature of Rayleigh scattering has been leverage as a fundamental working principle in OTDR technology. The volume of source light energy backscattered to the detector provides a reliable indication of attenuation and signal or optical loss in the optical fiber link. Now, the properties of light reflection categorized by optical physicist Augustin Jean Fresnel predated the discoveries of Rayleigh. 
but were equally important to the development of OTDR working principles. Fresnel discovered the reflection coefficient, which is a ratio of the reflected light wave amplitude relative to the original source wave. He found that the reflection coefficient could be predicted for the interface of two materials based on the respective refractive indices of these components. Fresnel reflections occur when light reflects off a boundary of two optically transmissive materials, each having a different refractive index. This boundary can occur at a joint, connector, or mechanical splice, at a non-terminated fiber end, or at a break. Since many events of interest in an optical fiber link, such as splices, breaks, connections, and terminations, all represent specific material intersections, such as glass and air, the Fresnel reflection equation can be used to determine the type, location, and intensity of these events. Now, IOR stands for Index of Refraction. All right, let's next look at absorption. Another physical property that is integral to fiber optic performance is the absorption of the fiber. As the name implies, a small percentage of the original light intensity is absorbed by internal impurities over the length of the fiber core. The greater the purity of the fiber, the less absorption will occur, meaning a higher quality material will result in less signal or optical loss. Since the elements that induce absorption are inherently non-reflective, they would not be detected through Fresnel reflection measurements. Instead, the effects of absorption are captured through the backscatter effect, as the light returning to the source is absorbed proportionally to the incident light. OTDRs display trace results by plotting reflected and backscattered light versus distance along the fiber, essentially categorizing any reflective and non-reflective events in a fiber link. OTDR traces have several common characteristics. Most traces begin with an initial input pulse that is a result of a Fresnel reflection occurring at the connection to the OTDR. Following this pulse, the OTDR trace is a curve sloping downward and interrupted by gradual shifts. The gradual decline results from insertion loss or attenuation of the backscattering as light travels along the fiber. This decline may be interrupted by sharp shifts that represent a deviation of the trace in the upward or downward direction. These shifts or point defects are typically caused by connectors, splices, or breaks. The end of the fiber can be identified by a large spike after which the trace drops dramatically down the y-axis. Finally, the output pulses at the end of the OTDR trace results from reflections occurring at the output of the fiber end face, referred to as ghosts, events that are technically non-existent events. Now, as shown in the trace example, the y-axis represents power level and the x axis shows distance. When you read the plot from left to right, the backscatter values decrease because the loss increases as the distance increases. Interpreting OTDR traces may seem intimidating to novice users, but they don't have to be. Some advanced OTDRs automatically interpret the trace and provides a detailed graphical map of events. So, looking at this OTDR trace at point A, this is the OTDR connector. 
Note the large reflectance makes it impossible to categorize the loss in the first connector. In this case, a launch fiber of about 300 feet is being used. This allows the OTDR to categorize the first connector of the link under test as seen at point B. Point C shows two connectors that are too close together for the OTDR to properly categorize the loss in each. Point D is a loss event with no reflectance, likely a bad splice or APC connector. Point E shows a typical UPC connector with reflectance and loss. And point F depicts a connector with reflectance where the signal after the connector is stronger than before, often called a gainer. This is indicative of connecting fiber types with different backscatter properties. Point G is the end of the fiber. Note the strong reflection makes it impossible to determine if there is a connector there and the connector's performance. The OTDR has often been regarded as a troubleshooting tool, and indeed it is valuable for locating events that are causing performance issues after the cabling plant is live. However, categorizing the entire link via an OTDR trace during initial testing offers several benefits for both the technician and the customer, and it helps reduce the risk of using only an optical loss test set. While the optical loss test set calculates the total loss of the entire link in the most accurate and repeatable way as required by industry standards and a pass or fail indicates whether the link falls within the maximum insertion loss for a given application, specific event losses are completely invisible to an optical loss test set. This means that a good connection can hide a bad one. Now, why does this matter? Well, a fiber link can contain several connectors and or splices, and often terminations and splices are performed by different technicians, some of whom may be more skilled than others. Other disturbances such as dirty fiber end faces or microbends and macrobends can also occur within the link as a result of poor workmanship or other installation factors. Categorizing the fiber with an OTDR makes it possible to pinpoint the location of any fault and verify that the quality of the installation meets the design specifications for current and future applications and ensures that there are no unplanned loss events due to poor cable management uh, or uh, errors in the installation. It also allows the technician to see the performance of specific connection points and their location within the link to easily identify any questionable connection points that may need to be addressed due to air gaps, poor fiber core alignment, lack of cleanliness, or other problems that can occur during installation. It is also possible that a link can pass a loss test yet still fail to carry network traffic due to reflectance issues, and only the OTDR will find that problem. Now, when it comes to fiber testing, one may ask, if an OTDR is used, is an optical loss test set still necessary? The answer is yes. The use of an optical loss test set is required by industry standards to ensure application compliance because it accurately measures total fiber insertion loss. The use of an OTDR does not replace the optical loss test set because the total insertion loss measurement achieved with an OTDR is an inferred calculation that does not necessarily depict the total loss that will occur on the link once it is live. 
especially in the case of multimode fibers where standards specify precisely controlled launch conditions. OTDR tests are not as accurate or repeatable as an optical loss test set. Now on the flip side, one may ask if an optical loss test set is used and the fiber link passes, is an OTDR necessary? Well, the answer to this question isn't quite as simple. First, it's important to understand that the specifications for a given project must be followed. If the specification requires OTDR characterization, Tier 2 testing in TIA standards and extended testing in ISO IEC standards, then an OTDR is indeed required along with the optical loss test set insertion loss testing. If it is not specified, OTDR testing is technically not required, but it is highly recommended by both industry standards and experts due to the valuable characterization and calculating reflectance in emerging uh, short-reach single-mode applications. In fact, due to ever tighter uh, loss budgets and less room for error, many network owners and designers are setting not only overall loss budgets, but also loss budgets for individual splices and connectors, which can only be verified with the OTDR. Additionally, it is recommended that OTDR characterization be done before optical loss test set insertion loss testing. The ability to measure the number, location, and performance of each splice and connector with an OTDR allows problems to be corrected during the installation process and prior to final insertion loss testing with an optical loss test set rather than afterwards when the network is live. Further, the final optical loss test set insertion loss test results are required for final proof of compliance. So if testing fails and there is the need to troubleshoot with an OTDR, testing will have to be performed again with the optical loss test set. And that concludes our webinar on optical fiber testing. As always, thank you so much for your attendance of our monthly Third Thursday webinars. Again, speaking for both Matt and I, we really uh, do appreciate the attendance every month and we really do enjoy putting on these webinars for you and hope that you find value in them. All right, without further ado, let's get to those questions. <music>